And we're back with another exciting episode of the Horror Guys Horror Bulletin Podcast. Ooh, brought to you by us. <laughs> horror Guys Studios. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And, and we're going to talk about some horror movies this whole week. whole bunch of movies this week. What do we got? And a short. Uh, we got three brand new ones this year. We got The Moor, and one called In uh, Arena Wars, and Realm of Shadows. Those are both kind of indies. And then we got a couple from 2018, The Perfection, and The Devil's Path. And we got a golden oldie from 1968 called Destroy All Monsters. Spoiler, they're not all destroyed. They don't all get destroyed. Nope, they no. don't. It's a Godzilla and Friends movie. <laughs> and they are mostly friends. Yeah, yeah, they are this time around. Not much infighting. All right, well, let's see. They have an enemy this time. What announcements do we have this week? Let's see. Horror Bulletin Magazine is out for the issue from May's movie. This is June, so it would be the June at issue number 33 is available now. All the stuff we saw. Yep, check on, stop on over to, Am if you're on Amazon and you do Kindle Unlimited, you know their subscription thing where you get the free books every month, mm -hmm. it's free for you all month. Oh, or you can read them as part of the subscription. And if it's not, well, it's still cheap and easy. Yeah, it is. Like just, us. Just like us. Yes. <laughs> Paperback or ebook. If you don't do ebooks, just because it's called Kindle doesn't mean you have to have one of those Kindle devices. You can read that on your iPhone or your Android or Pretty much tablet any device, or computer. There's an app where you can download. Yeah, even I think off the website. Even I don't think you can do it on a smart TV, but just about anything else. If you air, airplay to a smart TV, well, you could. Could you? Could, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now or screen, available screen on a share. screen near Screen you. share. Airplay is Mac only, but you know, well, uh, Chromecast share. or any of those yeah, things. Any yeah. of them. Yeah. All right. So yeah, stop in, check out our books at Horror Guys. Dot com. No, what is it for the books? Horrorguysshop.com takes you to all our books. Horrorguys.com works for everything, too. Yeah, you can find yeah. everything on horrorguys.com. That's the source. And, of course, if you get our newsletter, horrorbulletin.com, you get all our reviews in your email. Now also including the podcast in that email. There's a little link at the top just to play the show. Neat. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that is. You can read it. Or if you get tired of reading that long pile of emails, you can just listen. To listen, it. Yeah. yeah, and you get our, our wonderful soothing, personalities, our soothing voices whispering in your ear, telling you what we really think and don't want to put in print about some of these movies. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. Well, we have the full spoilers and everything there too. Yeah, you. Could, yeah, we're, <clears throat> like the new ones this week, we got several 2024 movies. We're not going to tell you how they end. That that would be spoiling. Uh, yes, that's what I meant on the website. But we, if you we read them, the, podcast. the spoil there are a whole synopsis there on the on the newsletter or the site. Yep, yep, yep. yep. There was something else I was going to say. Oh yeah, the podcast itself. If you're already subscribed, well, don't do anything. It's fine. But it's now also available on YouTube podcasts. Interesting. It's always been a video on YouTube. If you're subscribed to us on YouTube, you see one of those things with, you know, our thumbnail is our video. And then the, this podcast is underneath that for audio, but it's not really a video. It's, it's still there also, but now it's officially podcast yeah. on YouTube. YouTube has podcasts now, which is just audio shows, and you can play those through YouTube Music much like you can Apple Podcasts or any of those other podcasty things. Mm -hmm. So if you are one of those people who like YouTube podcasts, we're there now. Search for us, Horror Bulletin or Horror Guys. Um, I think that's all the announcements. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Buy our books, listen to our shows, subscribe, like, mash the smash button, and because all that other Because we are our own sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. We're going to start out. You want to start out with the new ones? And yeah. yeah. Not read them out. all? Or? Well, let's start out with a new one. 2024's The Moor, M-O-O-R, which was directed by Chris Cronin, written by Paul Thomas, stars Sophia LaPortia, David Edward Robertson, Elizabeth Dormer Phillips, and Bernard Hill. Runtime is an hour and 58 minutes, a little on the long side. Uh, and there's a trailer in the show notes. Yeah, Bernard Hill Link was in this. It. He was the uh, King Theoden in Lord of the Rings. Oh, right. And he just recently died. I think this is his last movie. Okay. So if you thought he was cool in Lord of the Rings. He's cool in this. He's an old guy that gets interviewed for the show. I mean, he's not actually a character so much. That's what they want you to think. He's actually the puppet master behind the whole thing. You do the spoilers, That's you do theory. the real thing. I'll do the spoiler free judgment. Okay, myself. go for it. Uh, this was grim and moody and quite slow moving. It pulls you along, though, and we didn't think it ever got dull. Much of it takes place on an endless, flat, foggy landscape. 
It kind of makes it more chilling when something strange pops up. And it caps off with a satisfying ending. We'd give it a thumbs up. Yeah, this is uh, definitely not an action thriller. No. No, no. It, it's. I could see where a lot of people might call this one boring. I would not be one of those people. No, I wasn't bored at all. Yeah. I think I was less satisfied with the ending than you were. Oh, I, I didn't quite ending, understand though. the ending. Oh, I, I think I did. And yeah, that kind of got to me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What an ending! Yeah, well, we're not going to tell you I was the impressed because yeah, it is new and you haven't seen it. You need to either read about it or watch it. Yeah, we will read just a little bit of the introduction here, so, so you get a feel of what it's about. Well, we open up on two children arguing about robbing the candy store. Well, shoplifting is more like it. They're not little bandits. Right, yeah. The little boy distracts the shopkeeper while his friend loads her bag with snacks and runs out. Her friend doesn't come out, so she goes back inside looking for him, and the shopkeeper, shopkeeper says his dad came in and took him. Yeah, it was around the corner. She wasn't actually watching the front of the store. It would, I'll meet you in this alley. And he never he showed. He doesn't. And she goes back to the store and says, well, his dad got him. Well, well as uh, the credits roll, we see missing, missing posters of that boy and many other posters, followed by headlines telling us that a man was sentenced to 25 years for the crime. So off screen during the credits, they've had this long investigation of this mass child abductor. They've caught him and they have sentenced him to prison and did not find bodies no they don't know where the kids are yeah i think they definitely know that he did it though i yeah. oh see, yeah we, uh-huh. we never see the bad guy we don't no. see the criminal and we don't know his motivations all we know is he was arrested mm-hmm. and then a time jump 25 years later claire has grown up and talks to bill the boy's father about the killer's sentence is almost up they never found little danny's body so they couldn't look the, lock the man up forever Bill wants to go up to the moors and search for the body. He figures if they find the body, that will prove it was murder, and they can lock the man up forever. Yep. Well, he complains about how the vultures from the news have hounded him for me for years. And this was about the time when we were kind of wishing for subtitles. Oh, yeah, they're, we didn't even talk about that yet. They were sitting in a coffee shop talking, and boy, they had strong accents. <laughs> they're British, Scottish. Mm-hmm. I don't even know when they get that mushy. But, it, uh, but we, they were hard to understand It got at first. easier as it went along. Yeah, you, 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 you pick up the cadence eventually, and it makes all sense. But, boy, that first five minutes was, what, what? the hell are, are they, they talking saying? about important things here? <laughs> yeah. You'll figure it out. It's not that bad. Yeah. And the yeah. version we have didn't have subtitles. If you can get subtitles on whatever you're watching, you might want to do that. Yeah, they honor, honored us with a screener version. We, we screener without subtitles. Well, yeah. It is just what assume, it, hey, it they is speak what it English. Is. They'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, Claire agrees to go with Bill and Liz to search the Peat Moss Moors. They have a map, and they're systematically searching the whole thing, which is going to take many days. And Liz is an expert. She's like a ranger. She knows the, yeah. she knows the land inside and out. She's all about safety and you know stuff to bring. And, yeah, she's really on top of everything, so she's a good guide for them. Then we cut to an old interview with people originally involved with the investigation 25 years ago. People talk about the moors, where the bodies were supposedly hidden, but never found. Claire talks to Mr. Thornley, an old friend who was in charge of the original search, and he mentions that Bill still goes up there all the time to search. He knows all about the moors, and shows that the moors are much, much larger than Claire realized. It's not going to take a few days. (laughs) Claire's looking at this one little map. And he says, oh, no, and he gets out all these maps and overlaps them. It takes up this great, big, huge table area. <laughs> However big England is, this moor is like eight times bigger. Yeah, it's gigantic. <laughs> and she said, how could anything be found in this? And Thornley is confused why Bill is searching this one particular area. But then we find out. Claire mm. goes to see Bill, who has a psychic there, doing dowsing, pointing to areas on a map. Well, that just gets weird fast. It does, yeah. All right, well, Bill, Claire, and Liz go back out for some more searching, and Liz reiterates how dangerous it is here. It's all very scenic in a really bleak kind of way. It's very gray. It's very dark. And the visibility is bad because there's fog, and there's wet, marshy areas that you can sink into. and Yeah, it's... It's kind of, kind of hazardous. Yeah, they get out of the car the first time. I'm like, this is no big deal. It's a field. Well, it's mushy. It goes on a lot more it's than that. It's mushy and gushy. Yeah. And then there's valleys, or not valleys, gullies that you can fall into too. And yeah, it's not too safe. Miles and miles of bleak, foggy, grassy swamp terrain. 
All right. Well, we're going to stop there. We should. Yeah. They they do find some stuff. Stuff happens. And so the psychics get involved. Uh huh. There and is definitely horror, supernatural to a point. Yep. Psychic weirdness and ghosty weirdness. And, yeah. Yeah. Everyone here has thick accents, and the version we watched didn't have subtitles. Depending on where you're watching it, try to turn the subtitles on. <laughs> they are very British, but after a few minutes, we got used to it. We did. Yeah. We watch Doctor Who every week. We don't have much trouble with them, but these guys, they were thick. Yeah. Thick they were. accent. Yeah. It's very slow-moving, atmospheric, and moody. Really, the hopeless gloom and dankness of the setting are the biggest part of the film. Mm -hmm. The music and the camera work are really good. It's slow-moving, but not boring. At least I didn't think so. Uh, there's not much horror going on there until about 90 minutes in. Just kind then, of then an overwhelming there. sense of dread and hopelessness that permeates the whole thing. Yeah, you, you know, ain't never going to find anything <laughs> in this swamp, but yeah. they're going to try. Yeah. And they do. And they, uh, things happen. Yeah. It's more moody than horrific, but it does a really good job with what it's got. Yeah. I'd give it a thumbs up. Yeah. I might go with favorite of the week on that. I might too. Yeah, I think I would. Well, no, no. Oh, no. I'm I like the, the perfection. perfection a lot. Yeah, the perfection yeah. was my favorite of the week. Yeah. This one to be number two. Yes. Yeah. Arena Wars 2024, directed by Brandon Slagle, written by him, also Michael Mayhall and Sonny Mayhall. Stars Michael Madsen, Eric Roberts, and Robert Lasardo. Woohoo, big stars. <laughs> well, sort of. <laughs> each one's got like three minutes of screen time. A few, a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> one hour, 36 minutes. Uh, There's a trailer. There is a trailer. On YouTube. Yeah. It's a very cool looking trailer. You want to check that out for sure. Yeah. Spoiler free, we wouldn't really call this horror, but it's a decent science fiction action flick with lots of gore and combat. If you like the old Running Man movie, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing, only more violent. Yeah, running, more gory. Running Man meets uh, the Purge. You know, there's some some little elements of, you know, tributes. I think to other little things here and there. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It's got also a satirical tone to it with plenty of dark humor. It's got a large cast. It gets narrowed down as the mayhem flows along. We will call it well made overall and entertaining. A lot of fight combat. Yeah? Yeah, they went all out on the fighting in this one. There's quite a bit of talking, too. I mean, there, there's a lot yeah. of drama going on besides, besides the just the fighting. It's such a mix. And it was like only an hour and 36 minutes. Like It just felt like they crammed a lot in efficiently. I mean, I thought it worked. You know, overall, I, 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 I liked it. Okay. You know? Well, get us started with how it begins. Well, it's 2045 in the big city generically in the future actually the, in, the subtitle says it's the big effing city big, big effing city yeah. <laughs> I, I want i suppose that's the real name of it you suppose maybe yeah well there's some kind of arena fight going on a man in armor with a pickaxe fights against a man in a prison outfit as two commentators talk about the bout if you've ever seen pro wrestling it's mm -hmm. like that only with axes yeah a woman in a mask cutie pie comes out and beheads the prisoner TV execs talk about how to raise the ratings. How do we win back the audience? Well, we cut back to Luke Bender, who's in federal prison. He talks to the parole board about getting released. He's not very cooperative, gets sent back in for more time. He gets a video call from Admiral Jordan, who asks how the hearing went. And that's Eric Roberts phoning in his role. Quite literally phoning it in this time. <laughs> yeah. Another prison prisoner, Arturo Perez, goes into the parole board, and he's on death row. His only option is to participate in Arena Wars, the show, fighting show we saw earlier. And we cut to the show, where there are now ten new prisoners. The man there explains the situation and the rules to them. If you make it out alive, you get to go home, and they get no weapons. Well, the show's hosts, Samson and Moses introduce the show and their regular killers. They kind of look like wrestlers crossed with superheroes in combat suits. Calypso and Cutie Pie we've seen before. Each of the prisoners is injected with something, and the prisoners joke about getting convicted of murder, and the only way they can get out is to murder some more. Got in here by killing people. The only way we're getting out is by killing more people. Yeah. Well, one nervous young prisoner gets cut up right away. A couple guys wait in the back a little too long, and their heads explode. That's what the injections were about. Oh, my. Yeah. And before long, Perez is the only fighter left alive. He beats the guy with the knives, but then another fighter comes out to stop him, and he's pulled into a hole into the, in, the, in the wall by someone. We should 
Yeah, we should maybe, stop there. Maybe pause there. And this is like maybe five minutes after the credits stop. So we're way into this. Mm-hmm. Or, or, well, not well, just getting started, really. Yeah. And well, and and it was interesting because I had just said, you know, they're they're struggling with ratings. And the thing that I said, well, the problem is there's no one to root for. There's these awful fighters who are awful people, and these awful prisoners who are awful people, and you know, like, there's no good guys that you're rooting for. Oh, the criminals are dying. Oh no. Well, oh, no. anyway. <laughs> yeah. And once in a while, the gladiators who are you know killers and awful people die. And they, you know, and I said that, and then the executives realize, oh yeah, there's no one to root for. We need to fix that, and they do. <laughs> they so, do. Yeah, sorta. Well, okay. Well, the concept here is a new take on The Running Man with costume fighters in an arena and an innocent man, spoiler, not really, forced to fight for his freedom. This one has a surprisingly large amount of talking and drama for what amounts to an action movie, but it mostly works pretty well. Mm-hmm. Now, the character, you already heard about him, Perez, I kept expecting him to make a comeback later on. Robert Lasardo, he's one of the bigger stars in the movie. We didn't actually see him die in his fight. He just sort of disappeared into a hole in the wall, which actually that was his death. We did, he didn't come back. Yeah, he never did. Yeah. And somebody else later on gets sucked into the same hole and the same thing happens, and we're like, oh, that's what happened. Yeah. But we kept expecting him to come back. <laughs> Where'd he go? Uh, Michael Madsen, who got top billing, doesn't get a whole lot of screen time, but he plays one of the commentators and does well with the role. We both joked that Eric Roberts was literally phoning in his role, but that was actually explained in the story, and there was a good reason for it. And also a comment, too, if you uh, watch the movie, watch through the credits, speaking of Michael Madsen. The end credits, yeah, he's the got end, more at the, the end. The end credits, yeah, he's, he's got some interviews, things going at the end that are pretty funny. Wow, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the acting is decent, and the lighting, sound, and music are good. The sets seem appropriate, and the acting is decent for a movie of this type. It's a fight movie. You're not expecting, you know, Shakespeare. No, no, you're not. (laughs) The fight choreography looked good, and it all made sense. It's kind of predictable. There's not a lot of surprises here, but we definitely enjoyed it. Yeah, watch the preview, and if If that looks looks good good, to you, that's exactly what you're going to (laughs) get. Yep. Realm of Shadows, 2024, directed by Jimmy Drain. Written by Robert Bieber, Jimmy Drain, and Lewis Leslie. Stars... Tony Todd, Vernon Wells, and Jimmy Drain. Hour and 25 minutes. You know, I looked for Vernon Wells throughout the movie, and you know where he shows up? At the very, very end. The end credit scene. Yeah, strange way to do that. Yeah, well. (laughs) Okay. All right, so this is uh, spoiler-free. It's an anthology. It is. Uh, Tales wrapped around witchery and good versus evil. Some, Some of the short stories had no dialogue, and I thought that was kind of cool yeah you know how some of the shorts we do off of youtube don't speak that way it gives them an international audience this one did some the, the same thing i don't know did. how international it was well, but some of the stories didn't have any talking yeah uh despite top billing tony todd only makes a small appearance but he's always good to see we thought that some of the stories may be a little on the weak side but as a whole it's a decent piece of work yeah this movie and the one that before that shows us how you know B B list actors, would you say? I don't know. I guess Tony Todd probably is an A list. Not a no, yeah. I wouldn't. Yeah. What uh, what is that class of actor where they've done big things, former big and, stars, and now they do indie work? I think you know just because they. Well, I think Tony Todd could still get all the work he wanted. He's just you know getting mm-hmm. old and he likes to take it easy. Mm-hmm. Michael Madsen. Mm, well, kind of takes what he can get, I bet. But it's hard to say whether you know these actors just love the love working. Oh yeah, I'm sure somebody, they do. Somebody calls them up and says, "Hey, will you be in my movie?" And they say, "Yeah." <laughs> but you know, thirty <laughs> years ago, if you weren't or... big in, in with the studios, you didn't get into the movies. Now there's so many indie people. I bet these these I don't, don't want to hate, hesitate to say small actors. No, because they're, they're they're recognizable names. Yeah, and done yeah. tons of stuff. People can get them for the movies. They I, well, they probably can, they could, can afford them for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, if yeah. they could put in an afternoon of yeah. filming, and they're not going to be it. able to call up Sylvester Stallone and say, "Hey, will you be in this Arena Wars movie as the narrator?" You know, <laughs> you know, it's <for, laughs> not what it used to be for either. whatever <laughs> reason. Whether you know Michael Madsen just wanted to do it, or you know they could afford him, or whatever. Yeah. Not to know. pick on these movies or pick on these actors. It's just a change in the way movies are made. Yeah, it is. These yeah. indie movies have get, gotten lower budget, and the the big name actors they are can much get more approachable names. than they used to be. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, so Tony Todd shows up. Uh, we thought it, stories. Some of the stories were a little yeah, on the got, weak got side, kind of sidetracked. Yeah, but overall, it was a decent piece of work. Yeah, yeah, and that so overall a thumbs up. Yeah. Well, this is an uh, an anthology, so it's I did, didn't count them four or five or seven stories on here. Bunches. Yeah, we're not going to read them all, but I will get a good start going Give here. Give them a little taste. We're told about a magic dagger that has been sought and fought over for thousands of years as credits roll. Nalem goes to the strip club and talks to the other girls working there. We cut to priests talking and praying. The women go into the basement, set up a Ouija board, and do some kind of spell that opens up... The Realm of Shadows! Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we move into our first story called Malik's Dream Lady. A guy named Malik walks into a bar and talks to Sarah, the bartender. His friend comes in and wants Malik's, Malik to hit on the girl who just came in. Sarah is suddenly replaced by a strange new man who says he can make that girl like Malik, but he needs a strand of her hair. Malik gets some hair for the guy. Well, actually, he got a whole big chunk of hair. Yeah, I had to hurt. Without early noticing, yeah. But the guy vanishes. <laughs> In the morning, Donna, the girl from the bar, comes to his apartment. They have fun. Then she stays all day watching him do laundry and mundane stuff. Malik figures out that something is wrong and goes back to the bar to ask Sarah about that relief bartender. She said there wasn't one. He and Sarah then leave together, and we see the strange bartender there after they leave. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, and then, okay, here's a, here's a weird one. The next story, Malik again. Same guy, same name, and Sarah. I think it's the same girl, isn't it? I thought it was. Could be. Yeah. They're now a happy couple, and he has a ring for her. In the morning, she leaves him a note and takes the ring away with her. He then goes for a hike in the hills. When he gets home, Sarah is there waiting for him and crying. He wakes up. It was all just a dream. So he goes into the other room, and he proposes to her. And, and that was the one of the not speaking ones. No one speaks in that one. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, well, there's, see, there's one, two, three, four, five more. Uh, the little anthology stories that I'm not going to get into and spoil for you. And then the wraparound comes back at the end and kind of wraps things up. Yeah, they are all 10, maybe 15 minutes long at the at the longest, so they're all fairly short. Uh -huh. Some of them are just a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. All right, well, anyway, uh, the bigger name stars only appear in the fi final segment, so don't come looking for a lot of Tony Todd here. Vernon Wells and Harley Wallen, they're both mentioned in the right up front in the credits, they have a very brief after credit scene. Most of the segments star the director, Jimmy Drain, and this is the weak point of the movie in my opinion. He's pretty bland in every segment. I, he's just... I'm going to be kinder he, about he that than you. He did a fine job of directing. It looks good and everything, but he should leave the acting to somebody else. Well, and it could be a case, too. It's hard to direct and act, you know, and you're not seeing your own performance. It might have been a stronger acting performance, with somebody else directing, you know, another set of eyes looking at him and say, you know, Jimmy, do this on this scene, Jimmy, you know. Okay. You one, know, one or the other. Be angrier, or be angrier here. Yeah, I think it might have been stronger with, you know, two people doing it. He's in most, if not every segment. And he does a, he does do a decent job directing, but and I thought his acting was decent too. I mean, he gets the job done. Yeah, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm It's hard to argue with bland though. I'm I'm more forgiving about it than you. It was also confusing hmm. because he played different roles in different stories. Sometimes had the character name, same character name, but sometimes he didn't. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a little hard to tell which one's which. Sometime, I think those first two segments were the same character and people, but I wouldn't swear to it. Uh -huh. There are several segments with no dialogue, and the music in these is quite good. Actually, I think I like the silent segments better than the ones with dialogue. I think Cadaver was probably the best of the bunch. Mm -hmm. That's not one of the ones we talked about. And as Kevin always says with movies like this, it needed more Mel. Yes, it did. It's got Mel Novak Mel as Novak. the priest in the beginning and yeah. I think at the end. And There's a number of these indie movies where Mel Novak shows up. And he's another one of those actors, a big-name guy is, who shows up in yeah, he's been, little movies. He's been doing stuff for ages, and he pops up in these movies, and... I don't know. There's just something about him really appeals to me. He just comes across as really natural and likable. And do you follow him on Facebook? I always want more. Yeah, I do. Yeah, he's he's very devout. He likes working, and he likes working. Yes. Yeah, he stays busy, and yeah, he's he's up there age wise, but he stays active and mm -hmm. doing stuff. Yeah. 
But just one of those little, you know, no, I don't no say way. Easter egg kind of things, but he shows up. Ah, it's Mel. <laughs> <laughs> the wraparound segment really didn't go anywhere, and the ending was more of a cliffhanger than a real ending. The stories are on the weak side, but we thought it was well made, and it looks good. Yeah, overall, if you're into little thumbs up. Uh, modern anthologies, it's worth a shot. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And speaking of short films, we watched one called Occupant this week. Just came out. Written and directed by Peter Salella. Stars Daniel O'Brien, Lauren September, Carolyn Jennings, and Kira Powell. Four minutes, 21 seconds. You don't get much shorter than that. But it was pretty good. And there's a link to watch it on the show notes. What happens? Well, a father tells his young daughter a twisted bedtime story, but she likes it. Crocodile eating the rabbit. <laughs> then he goes into the next room where his wife tells him that he just came into the room and said he was going to go to the bed a minute ago. Didn't you just say that? Didn't you? Yeah. Well, then he hears something strange outside and goes to investigate. And there is, in fact, something strange. Yes. It's a really simple plot that mostly focuses on the creepiness of having something in your backyard that you can't quite see. We've seen scenes like this, uh, maybe a little body snatcher type action, and it was really well done. If Brian had a complaint, and <laughs> well, I mean, this is written first person by Brian. Um, yeah, the dark scenes were maybe a little bit too dark. But what was happening was always clear. Yeah. yeah. He goes out in the dark and looks around, and you can't see a darn thing. A little too dark sometimes. But, but there's a little flash here and there. Quick. You figure it out real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Liked it. All right. Would now, recommend. 2018's The Perfection. Never heard of this when it came out. No, I completely had missed this one. So we went into it blind, and what a pleasant surprise. Directed by Richard Shepard. Written by Richard Shepard, Nicole Snyder, and Eric C. Charmello. Stars Allison Williams, Logan Browning, and Stephen Weber. Hour and 30 minutes. Trailer in the show notes. Uh, anyway, we will both give this our thumbs up on this one and recommend that... Uh, go into it blind. Go into it blind, yeah. there There is a trailer, but don't do it. So again, we're not going to spoil it. Don't, yeah, just just yeah. just watch it. Yeah, just, I mean it's six years old, but, but let's not spoil don't it. spoil it because I think this is really an under the radar movie for a lot of folks probably. Spoiler free. What Spoiler happens? free. Oh, like we said, this was an excellent movie to go into blind. It starts out as one thing and then goes somewhere else and then somewhere else again. Uh, some things could be predicted and some things not. We really liked it. It was very entertaining. How's that for fake? Yeah. <laughs> Not spoilery. Definitely, we thought it was going to be one way, you know, 20 minutes in. Mm -hmm. And no, it does and other things. Other things happen. Yeah. Well, a woman, again, I'm not going to spoil it. A woman lies dead in bed with people talking in the hallway. With her mother now dead, Charlotte may be able to go back to performing, something she hasn't done in years. She gave up her career to care for her ailing mother, and now mom's dead. Credits roll. All right, so... Back in the workforce or Maybe. something. Uh-huh. Cellist. Charlotte calls Anton and Paloma and leaves a message about joining them in Shanghai. She sees a billboard for Elizabeth Wells, who is now a big cello star. She meets Paloma and Anton at a concert. Lizzie is there as well, and Charlotte clearly doesn't like all the praise that she's been receiving. Theus and Jeffrey, two old teachers, are there as well. We then get a flashback to Charlotte shaving her head, slicing her wrists, and getting shock therapy. Oh, so, so we figure she's crazy. Something grim happened in there. We're going to yeah. have a psycho thing going on here. Yeah. Um, a Sort of a fatal attraction for music. Yeah, maybe. I kill your cello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie and Charlotte talk. And Lizzie said she would never leave the group, but she is going on vacation starting tomorrow. As they come back inside, a man throws up, gets a nosebleed, and collapses. There's some kind of hemorrhagic fever down south, and someone thinks that maybe that's what he had. And then you're thinking, oh, crap, it's going to be a plague movie. Yeah. Anton asks Lizzie to play for them, and she asks Charlotte to play second chair. Charlotte says, no, she's an amateur now, but it doesn't take much convincing. It goes well, and we see the two of them running off and kissing, dancing, and having lots of smoochy, smoochy fun afterwards. They are very good friends. They are now. Yes, yeah. Well, you, nobody plays Chiller better than you. Oh, you do. No, you do. Okay, and the things escalate. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to stop talking here because the rest will be spoilers. Yep. Oh, yeah. The Mount Rushmore of Horror. Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger... And that nasty Chinese bus driver. <laughs> yeah, wow. He, he was something. He yeah. was something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this was two years before... Uh, um, um, yeah, um, we can't um, talk about those either. There's kind of spoilers mumble, mumble, here. Mumble. Okay. 
Yeah, well, we went into this blind, and for quite a long time, we thought we were going to get a plague movie. This is not a plague movie. Still, it did twist and turn a few times, and some of it we predicted, some of it we didn't. We were definitely entertained by this. I think we're both going to say this is our pick of the week. Yep, it was. It was mine. I think Always so. hurts to pick one that's six years old over the new ones. <laughs> but we missed this one the first time. It's we, not our fault. We did, yeah. Somehow totally missed it. Well, 2018 was a weird year. We started right at the end of 2018. Yeah. We weren't making a point to watch everything. Uh-huh, yeah. Also from 2018, The Devil's Path. Directed by Matthew Montgomery, written by him, and also Stephen Twardokas. Stars Stephen Twardokas. How would you like to be named Twardokas? That's an interesting name. J.D. Scalzo and John Gale. Hour and 27 minutes. Trailer in the show notes. Uh, boy, that is a really crappy looking movie poster. It's not great. I would not want to see that if I had seen this movie poster first. But you should see it. Yeah, it was, it's good. It was pretty darn good. It's beautifully filmed entirely in a forest with trails and manages to have a surprising number of people in it. It's mainly about two of them, and the back and forth between them is done very well. There are points that require a little bit of suspension of belief, especially if you ponder them afterward, and we still quite liked it quite a bit. It's one of those ones where we were talking about it two days later. You know... That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. and what, How did that happen? Did, Why did he do that? How did that happen? Yeah. But it's a, it's a fun watch. Yeah. Well, we thought so. Again, there's some surprises in this one, so <clears throat> daggone it, we can't spoil we, any we of these this week. We can't spoil this one either. Yeah. Okay, you wait for Destroy All Monsters. We will spoil the heck <laughs> out of that. We will spoil it, but I'm going to give you a little taste here. All right. What's, what's up with the Devil's Path? It's the early 1990s. Uh, Noah explains in a voiceover that he's felt the most comfortable in the woods. It's people who scare him. This place is our chance to leave it all behind. And credits roll. Well, a man hides in the woods and watches people walking on the trail below. He spots a guy with a beard and chases after him. He seems a little weird and out of it. He stops and sits next to the bearded guy on a bench and starts playing with a deck of tarot cards. The devil and the lovers come up. The, the weird guy is Noah and the bearded guy is Patrick. They start talking. Noah admits he doesn't get out very often. Which you can tell by his mannerisms. Mm -hmm. He's very Socially nervous. awkward, yeah. So, okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, they watch a gay man cruising in the woods. Another guy, Stan, comes in and sits between them. Love doesn't exist on the devil's path, says Stan, as the other two get up and leave. The two walk on and pass a couple of missing persons posters. Patrick points out that they both look kind of like Noah. Well, there's a blocked-off path. And Ranger, Ranger Tom says it's closed until they find the missing men. Some people have been attacked up there. Well, Ranger Tom, Ranger Tom gets called away, so the two guys decide to walk on the forbidden trail anyway. Noah takes his medication with shaky hands. Yeah, when there's medication shown, mm, it's what's always showing something. Uh huh. The area seems to be where gay men hook up for sex. And <clears throat> Noah seems a little uncomfortable with that. People don't, uh, they don't come here for love or romance. They come here to get off, Patrick says. Noah looks shocked. Mm-hmm. Well, they continue walking down the path. Patrick says he's an EMT and comes out here to feel something. Noah goes off to pee, and Patrick sees someone run by him with blood on his hands. He runs back to Noah, who's bleeding from a head wound and has trouble standing. Well, the bloody-handed guy comes back with a friend and weapons, so Noah and Patrick end up running through the woods. Yeah, and we'll stop there. Yeah, Noah says that the guy hit him on the head and ran yeah. off. Which, when they come back with weapons, seems pretty obvious. Yeah, so they run for it. Well, it's more of a psychological thriller than a horror movie, but it's very well done. If you don't like the woods, this is a good one. Of all the places in the huge forest, well, the, we thought the end was a bit of coincidental. Mm-hmm. Well, we know from the beginning that something weird is going on with Noah, but we don't know what exactly for a long time. And how weird, yeah. Yeah, nothing really ends up coming too far out of place or that requires too much of a stretch of a logic. We, we mentioned that there was some head scratchers, but yeah, it's, it's not that it's not that bad. It, it all makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and we would consider it horror in a horrible situation, but it's not, there's not... There, there's, there's not no like ghost. Jason's out in the wood or yeah, anything, there's, no. there's not Jason, it's not ghostly, it's not supernatural, it's just creepy, it's just people doing these things. The acting is good between the two main guys, and the setting is perfect for the story. It was a little draggy in a few places, but overall we liked it. Yep, we did. 
All right. Going back in time, 1968, Destroy All Monsters. This one's almost like 60 years old, so I think we could spoil this one I finally. I think we could get away with this one. Yes, a spoiler. Directed by Ishiro Honda and John Fuka. John Fukuda, Fukuda. written by I will let you read these Written names. by Ishiro Honda and Takeshi Kimura. Stars Akira Kubo, Jun Razakim, and Yukiko Kobayashi. He needs a comma in there somewhere. I will get that. Hour and a half, trailer in the show notes. Can I can I can I read that? Can Did I we watch that? the dubbed or the subtitle on this one? I think this one was dubbed. We read the dubbed one. Yeah. Saw okay. the dubbed one. Well, what happens? In the far flown future of nineteen ninety nine. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, this was thirty one years in the future when it came out. <laughs> The world is at peace. Straight space travel is commonplace. Going back and forth from the moon, there's a moon base. Space travel is as easy as airplanes. And Godzilla and all the other big critters have been rounded up and imprisoned on a big island. Life is great until aliens show up and mess it up. Freaking aliens. Yeah. Well, this was pretty fun with some really impressive model work. Yeah. I think this is the one, this was like the last of the classic ones of that period. They they started really going downhill budget-wise after this one. This one, they put some work into this. Yeah, they're, they're good yeah. models, good animals. They, they, they had built up a lot of stuff, and they used it all here. Yep. Well, as Kevin said, the year is 1999 in the future. There's a base on the moon, and spacecraft back, go back and forth on a daily schedule. We watch a spaceship launching. Credits roll. And I said right then, I thought that was a really cool spaceship launch. Mm-hmm. It's not going to hold up today's stuff, but it was really good for 60 years ago. Lots of little things moving. Yeah. yeah. We were told about the underwater base near an island where the scientists study marine life. All Earth's monsters have been collected and live on this island and live together in Monsterland. What a fantastic <laughs> name. Yeah. <laughs> not Monster Island, Monsterland. <clears throat> but it's not an amusement park. They don't, they don't let visitors in very much. You kind of could see where somebody might get ideas from that, though. Yes. Yeah. Godzilla, Rodan, Angurus, Mothra, Gorosaurus, and Manila are all there. If they try to leave, there are devices that drive them back. The control center is deep in the earth under the island. In the base, Kyoko gets a call from the moon. Her boyfriend, Katsuo, thinks there may be monsters on the moon as well, but the call is cut off before he can explain further. There's yellow gas being poured into the control room. This is on Monster Land, not on the moon. Right. And everyone passes out. The monsters are also being gassed, and they pass out as well. You know, if you could gas Godzilla that easy, why haven't they done that before? Well, they didn't need to. Maybe that's how they got in there. <sighs> well, all no. communications to Monster Land are cut off. The UN tries to see what's going on, and someone's jamming the cameras. But who? The Soviets call, in 1999, <coughs> oops, and Rodin is there destroying <laughs> Moscow. Paris is dealing with Gorosaurus, and the major cities of the world are being destroyed one by one by monsters, some of whom are from previous films that we didn't introduce earlier. Dr. Yoshido gives a press conference, and he can't explain why Tokyo has not been attacked. For a change. <laughs> On the moon, Katsuo sees a UFO, but it escapes. The moon base people get a call to return to Earth and land on Monsterland. Some new creature has taken over the island and they need to learn more. Katsuo and the others land at the base and find Kyoko and Dr. Otani there. I want all of you to cooperate with us, says Otani. He says they're still in controlling the monsters from here. Then he orders Mothra to derail a train. They go in and see the, and the Kylak Queen who is behind all this. Uh, Kylak is one of the asteroids, and she's from there. The queen is also shielded against attack. Well, then there's a gun battle between the mind-controlled scientists of the island and the men from the rocket. They take Otani along with them, but he still looks possessed. He won't answer any questions, and at the very first opportunity, he jumps out a tower window and dies. The people from Kylak capture Yoshido and Katsuo as another gunfight breaks out. They had a lot of gunfighting in here. Yeah, they do. Surgeons cut into Otano's brain and remove a tiny transmitter that was implanted in his skull. An old farmer up in the mountains finds a strange piece of metal, and very soon scientists from the moon base come to pick it up. The device is what the Kelax have been using to call the monsters. They announce that all the original island scientists need to be captured, including Kyoko. 
<clears throat> They're all under control of the aliens. Suddenly, the air raid siren goes off, and Rodan finally attacks Tokyo. Godzilla, Mothra, and Manda soon show up as well. All the monsters converge on Tokyo. All of them all at once. The tanks and missiles start firing, and they blow up more buildings than the monsters have wrecked. There's a lot of wreckage. A lot of collateral damage Tokyo from the fight. is in ruins. Mm, once again. The Kylax have built a new underground base in Izu, and that's why the monsters have come. Tokyo really gets a beating in these movies. This one especially. Kyoko walks right into the control room and wants to talk to the leaders in the press. If you all of you allow the Kylax to stay here, they'll send the monsters back to Monsterland. While well, Katsuo tackles her and pulls off her mind control earrings. Good thing she didn't have that embedded like the doctor did. Yeah. Kyoko wakes up, but she doesn't remember anything after the poison gas. Katsuo flies the rocket ship to Izu, but he can't land because Godzilla is there under the ship. The land forces the land forces open fire on Godzilla, and Angurus to- shows up to assist the big lizard. Rodan chases the rocket away. They're all working together. Hmm. Katsuo and two associates find the Kylak cave and go inside. The queen appears and invites them inside the huge facility, which includes docking areas for the UFOs. She says they want Mount Fuji, and says the humans have no right to it. Then the doors open, and they're released to tell everybody their message. Why don't humans have a right to Mount Fuji? Because we want it. Meanwhile, the humans have built a new control center on Monsterland and get ready to recall the monsters. Katsuo heads to the moon, where a signal is detected from there. They open fire and blow up the entire Kylak moon base. They soon see the Kylaks in their true form, little metal worm things. The group finds a strange machine that creates the monster-controlling waves, and they disable it. Finally, we're getting the upper hand. Dr. Yoshida wants to use the monsters to attack the Kylak base in Mount Fuji. Well, the first to arrive are Manila and Godzilla. I'm sure Manila's going to do a lot of good. Yeah. <laughs> Angurus, Manda, Baragon, Rodan, Kumunga, and the Gorosaurus show up right after. Okay, so yeah, a lot of people in this one. All the monsters. Yeah, not quite all of them yet. The more show up. Suddenly, a UFO shows up. It's no, it's not a UFO. It's King Ghidorah back from space. Oh, no. The Kylax are controlling him, and the Queen set calls to con- taunt Dr. Yoshido. The Earth monsters all remember Ghidorah and attack right away. Godzilla holds him, while Mothra and Kumunga shoot webs at him. Meanwhile, Majit Manila jumps up and down excitedly, because that's all about all that's he can get for. That's all because he's just his his job is to hang out. And he's be the cute. cheerleader. Yeah, and in, in case you don't remember, that's Godzilla's son, son of Godzilla. Yeah, yeah. he's just mini Zilla, cute little yeah, harmless. But can, he can blow smoke rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The monsters team up and make quick work of the three-headed space monster. Another burning monster comes down from space and crashes through buildings. It wrecks the base on Monsterland, turns around, and comes back for more. The queen reports that her fire dragon has destroyed Yoshida's machine, and Tokyo is next. Oh no! Except, free from control, Godzilla turns on the Kylax, shooting their base over and over. The monsters will fight for Earth even without being controlled. Yay! The Kylax turn back into metal slugs and hide. Katsuo says he can shoot down the fire dragon. Turns out the fire dragon is really just a flying saucer in disguise, which Katsuo is able to shoot down without too much trouble. Yoshio, Katsuo, and Kyoko watch as the various monsters all head back to their home. The Zillas wave at them as their helicopter passes. Happy ending. Like, bye! Well, not one monster, or two, or even three. This has all of them, 11 in total, including Godzilla, Manila, Rodan, Mothra, Angurus, Kumunga, Menda, Varan, Gorosaurus, Baragon, and King Ghidorah. Dang. We had to look up Manda. <laughs> He's from Atragon, which we did review. I don't know that they ever called him by name, though. And Angurus was from Godzilla Raids Again. Gorosaurus is from King Kong Escapes. We haven't seen that one yet. Not yet. We there's will. no big lizards in King Kong Escapes. <laughs> okay, well, there's a lot of models and miniatures in this one, probably more than in m- many of the other films. The monsters are just the aliens' pawns, but the spaceships are pretty cool. Until they aren't. Yeah, right? the, toward, toward the end, they're, they're fighting on our side. Yeah, the previous film was Son of Godzilla, which is kind of silly, but this one was uh, less 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 humor, more more, more serious. Fighting, yeah. yeah. It was good. We liked it. Yeah, yeah it was fun. Very fun. 
I don't know what we're going to watch next for the big monsters. There's a, there's a few of these uh, ones from that time period we could probably have skipped, like the Gods, like the King Kong movies. Mm-hmm. We'll find some. Do we care about Japanese King Kong movies? Not so much, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Tune in next week and find out. Yeah. Because that's all we're going to talk about this week. That's all of them. We only got to spoil, destroy all monsters. The rest of them are new enough and twisty enough we decided not to. You need to see them for yourselves. Or read up the spoilers on the website, horrorbulletin.com. But we'll see you next week with six more movies and a short. Okay. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. What'll we do next week? See ya. See ya. See ya.